Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for virtual Bulldogs Behind the Scenes featuring an exclusive look of the UMD Chocolate Lab. Well, my name is Molly Clevin and I'm from the University of Minnesota Duluth Alumni Relations team. Today, we're going to take a behind the scenes look at the UMD Chocolate Lab to learn how this unique resource provides chemical engineering students new pathways to connect ideas and concepts between classes and to connect students between grade cohorts. In this tour, you will see how faculty use the process of making chocolate to enhance student learning. Now to introduce our guests. I'm excited to introduce Dr. Steve Sternberg and Lyndon Ramrad. Dr. Steve Sternberg has worked in the Department of Chemical Engineering at UMD since 1999. He has taught most of the classes in the program and currently teaches courses in energy, environmental, and food engineering. His teaching efforts earned him the Horace T. Morris Distinguished Teaching Award in 2012, presented by the University of Minnesota Alumni Association. His research centers on environmental issues and has recently branched into the food and engineering with the creation of the Chocolate Lab. Beyond the classroom, Dr. Sternberg is a member of the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency's Environmental Justice Advisory Group. He also helps his college create a better teaching and learning environment with service on teaching focus committees and has published a book in 2015 titled Air Pollution, Engineering, Science, and Policy. Lyndon was born and raised on the Caribbean island of Trinidad and Tobago. He attended the University of the West Indies in St. Augustine, Trinidad, and has his Bachelor of Science degree in Agronomy and a Master of Science in Tropical Commodity Utilization. During his studies in the Caribbean agriculture, he has traveled to a number of different islands helping small farmers with their crops in the field. He met his wife while she was the study abroad student at the University of the West Indies in Trinidad, and together they have lived in Duluth since 2004 with their three sons. Lyndon is currently a lab coordinator in the Department of Chemical Engineering at UMD. I will now hand it over uh, to Dr. Sternberg and Lyndon. Hi, this is Dr. Steve. I'm in the Department of Chemical Engineering, and today Lyndon and I are going to talk about the Chocolate Lab. Lyndon? Hi, I'm Lyndon, and I'm the lab coordinator in the Department of Chemical Engineering, and we are really thrilled to be here to talk about our latest lab at UMD, the Chemical Engineering Chocolate Lab. First, I just want to thank everyone for showing up and uh, just wanted to tell you the weather here in Duluth is beautiful. It's sunny, just below freezing, and we're getting just a dusting of snow. So I hope you miss it if you're not in Duluth and you can think back to the good old days when you were here. So we're going to start. Lyndon's going to share a little bit about how the whole thing began. Yeah, I first started uh, at UMD about 10 years ago, and my mom would send me a care package of all these different sweets. And she would also include for me some cocoa beans. I would just take these cocoa beans and uh, make some tea in my office. And one day Professor Sternberg walked by and he had some tea. And then he decided that this was a great idea that he should uh, look further into how this was about. And I told him, well, it's chocolate. And he didn't believe me. And I bet him that I could show him these chocolate trees and I didn't believe it, but he came true. He flew me down to Trinidad and we saw some trees and here we are the very first trip. If you see this photo, my older brother, myself, a farmer, Mr. Martin Matthews, Mrs. Jackie Matthews, and probably Professor Steinberg right there. And we're examining some vanilla vines that are coming down a banana tree. Once we got our beans here, Professor Sternberg took his lab and here he has, he will talk to you about how we came up with the concept for our lab. Yeah, so um, for a long time, uh, faculty in the department have, uh, I guess you could call it complaint about students. And one, one of our biggest complaints is that students don't take information they learned in one class and bring it to the next one. So we call this a uh, compartmentalization where they learn uh, differential equation, and they know how to solve the second order Laplace equation in that course. When they see it again in a fluid mechanics class, it's like they've never seen it before. They don't remember that they know it or they, they don't associate it with what they learned in the differential equations class. And you know maybe it's because it's from a different instructor or maybe they're using different symbols or whatever the reason is, students are, just have a lot of trouble carrying information from one course to the next. And that makes it kind of hard to build because you have to kind of redo the same stuff over and over. And so we bandied about all sorts of ideas as to how we could help students connect classes. And when I learned about chocolate from Linden, I realized that all the steps that you use to make chocolate 
our chemical engineering processes. So we just call them unit operations and the entire process is, are things that we currently teach students about already. So on this post, poster that we're showing, um, the white boxes represent the unit operations. That's how chemical engineers think about the world. Little, they break a big process into smaller steps and each small step is just the one thing that you do to transform or alter or um, enhance a material. And you go through a series of steps until you get to the final product. Well, in this slide, you're seeing in the white boxes, those unit operations. In the orange boxes, you see the courses where we already are teaching this information. So my idea was to kind of create this lab as an across the curriculum experience. So students can, in a class, learn about the chocolate process, one little piece of it. And by the time they graduate, they'll know pretty much the whole process, they'll have been worked through it. But students can also then get involved in the lab on their own time and learn about the process, which is gonna set them up for when they take that course in the future, they're already gonna have some ideas and some structures in their heads to think about how, you know, what this really means. And so we're gonna walk through this process with you today um, from the unit operations point of view. And we'll talk a little teeny tiny bit about what some of the course um, tie-ins are with it. So the process that we showed there is we start with beans from the market. So we buy our beans. They have already been processed at the um, cocoa farms or estates. And there's a whole slew of processes that go on before the beans are ready for the market. At the end of our talk, we'll kind of talk a little bit about that as time, as we have time needs or our openings for that. So we're gonna start with, we have these beans. We make sure that we buy beans from ethical producers. This is generally a direct trade. Sometimes it's also called fair trade. With direct trade, the person we buy the beans from actually is going to the different cocoa states. They're all in tropical countries and he bargains directly with the farmers. And he makes sure that the farmers are getting a much higher price than they would on the open market because cutting out all the middlemen, it's just the direct trade person that's dealing with, there's not a whole bunch of steps in between. So the farmer generally gets about twice as much from direct trade, but it requires forming this personal relationship with somebody. Anyway, so we get the beans, we're in the lab, First step we do is we roast them, which is a chemical reaction. We'll talk about the, we'll go through these in, in more detail in a moment. Then we grind them, it's particle size reduction, very standard chemical engineering, mining engineering type of process. Winnowing is a separation. We have a course called separations in which we learn all about different methods to separate things. In the melanging step, it's basically a mixing or refining. It's one of the more important steps for the chocolate. We do a tempering, which is a heat treatment. It's just like what you would do for steel. You do the same kind of idea for chocolate. We'll talk more about it in a few. And then the finalizing, we do all the extra fun things, add flavors or uh, put cherries in there or nuts or whatever. We put them in particular molds, um, then they're ready for eating. Yes, here we have different types of beans. What you're seeing here are some bigger, lighter colored beans. These beans are a darker color. These are the unroasted, just fermented, dried beans. These dark beans are wild harvested and from Bolivia. They are pretty much out in the wild. They're not cultivated in any form or fashion. And you can see a difference in their size and their color, their weight. And if we could let you smell these, they would have a smell of fermented uh, yeast. Professor Sternberg will tell us about this chocolate process here. Yeah, so once we have the beans, uh, each bean is going to be different. You're going to want to treat them differently to bring out the different flavors. Some beans are very chocolatey. Some have really fruity flavors. And knowing what flavors you want to highlight is going to change the way you do the process. The first step is roasting. We're going to heat the beans up to about 250, but not more than 280 degrees Fahrenheit. At this 250, that's when the um, famous baking reaction occurs. It's called the Maillard reaction. And it's just a reaction between the sugars, the amino acids, you need some water in there, and of course the heat. And it's gonna create all the interesting flavor molecules. They're called flavonoids. Um, the, there's a, some standard uh, organic chemistry steps you can do to separate out things that are called methylpyrazines, and you can find out how much you have of that. It's not strongly correlated with the flavor, 
but it does show that the Maillard reaction is happening. And with enough practice, you can do a kind of a calibration between them. I think we're going to look at how we do the roasting here. So this is actually a standard coffee roaster. Um, we adapt it to do chocolates. Um, the coffee roaster is going to try to heat the beans up to about 480. We only want to go to 250. So in order to help control that temperature, we overload it with cocoa beans. So with coffee beans, you're going to put a quarter pound in there. We're going to put three pounds of cocoa beans in there. That's going to keep it from getting the really hot temperatures that you would need for coffee. Other than that, it works perfect for making the cocoa. The drum in there, you put the beans in there, it mixes them real nice, make sure everything gets a uh, uniform rate of heating. No beans are in the middle too long or no beans are on the outside for too long. We just basically fill the thing all the way up with cocoa beans. Um, it's kind of a fun step. One of the first things you would do if you were wanting to volunteer in the chocolate lab is we would have you operate the roaster, fill it up, charge it, and uh, get the equipment running. So you can just see I'm filling it up. You can see the beans. It makes a wonderful noise. They're, they're dry enough here where they make a kind of a clicking noise when they go together. Um, it is kind of a nice sound. The entire process here, the roasting takes about 18 minutes and then the equipment goes for another 12 minutes to do a cool down. So when it's done, you can open it up and you can immediately pull it out barehanded and you can actually eat the roasted bean. It's still warm, but it's not hot. Um, and it is the most intensely chocolatey flavor that you would ever experience in your whole life. If any of you get the opportunity to stop by the chocolate lab, we're gonna let you taste the cocoa bean. This chocolate process uh, will cover the topics of grinding and winnowing. First, we'll start with grinding. Particle size reduction is basically what we're doing here. We're starting with the cocoa beans. They're about an inch to about two inches in length. They're about a half inch to about three quarters of an inch thick. Uh, what we need to do is to grind these down to a quarter inch pieces, and this creates nibs, which come from the endosperm part of the bean, which is the inside of the cocoa bean, and the shell. And what we do is we separate it by passing it through a champion juicer. Yes, that's right, a champion juicer. It has an attachment and it allows the beans to be crushed, and it crushes them just to the right size. After this, we use a shop vac and some expertly constructed PVC tubes and a five gallon bucket. And we have devised an apparatus called a winnower where we have generate counter currents in the airflow to float away the shells from the, the cocoa nibs. After we're doing this process, what happens is that the nibs fall down into a bowl and the shells get whisked away into a collection bucket. What happens if we have too much shells getting into our nibs is that off flavors will happen. Shells, they are inconsistent with their color and they add some graininess and some gritty textures to your finished chocolate. Still, the shells though are very, very important historically and they can still be used and we do use them for making a wonderful brewed cocoa tea. So here we're looking at the um, parts of the champion juicer. It looks like a blade for making stuff really small, but it isn't. It just crushes them. The, after roasting, the beans are really quite um, brittle. You can smash them with your hand very easily, just crush them between a finger and thumb. Um, and this juicer just basically smashes them, and then they're going to fall out of it, and they're going to go directly into the winnower. So we used to do those as separate processes. Our students were lazy. They didn't want to do separate processes. So I challenged them to make a system where it just goes straight from the grinding into the winnowing process all, in, all together at once. It saves a couple of hours during the entire process. So um, I really like those lazy students that will think instead of work hard. So we're going to throw some beans into the champion juicer up at the top, then we're gonna turn it all on and you're gonna to get to see uh, them falling out of it, the size reduction you get. And then we'll also look down at the bottom where the winnowing um, separates out the nibs. Here you can see me breaking it by hand. You can see the shell, you can see the nib, right? The shell is lightweight, lower density, and 
Um, it's very flat. So it's gonna have a large surface area compared to the nib. Right? The nib is more like a rectangular box shape and the shell is a very flat shape. So by using that counter current airflow, it's gonna be pretty easy to make the shells float away from the nibs and help with the collection. I did a really good job on breaking that off. In the old days, that's how they did it. They didn't have champion juicers a thousand years ago. You got people to just by hand shell the beans. It seems like a lot of work I mean, I'm sure it was. You can't hear it, it's really loud in there. The grinding's happening. We also have the shop vac operating. Um, we generally will wear hearing protection during this step. Um, uh, one of the things we really practice in our department is safety. We want every one of our students to be safe. We want no injuries. And people who hire our students are very excited that our students are already imbued with the safety culture. They come, they want, they want the plant where they're working at to be safe. And they're gonna do the things to help keep it safe. Here you see the collection of nibs and a few shells get through and there is no separation that's 100% perfect. We could get all the shells out, but then we would be throwing away some nibs. We prefer the trade-off of collecting all the nibs, but having a few shells get through. Um, the shell side in the, in the orange tank there is not gonna have any nibs in it. So we wanna collect all the nibs, so we're willing to make the trade-off. That's a very standard chemical engineering idea of nothing is 100% perfect. And so you take the trade off of where do you, where is it okay to have some of the waste? Do you wanna waste some nibs to make sure you have all the shells out? Or do you wanna um, have some of the shells make it in with the nibs? And when there's a few percent, it's okay. You don't notice it too much. If you had all the shells in there, you would notice it in the flavors of the chocolate and the textures of it. Typically around 20 to 25% of the mass is shell and the rest is the nibs. Once we collect the nibs, we get to make the chocolate. And here I show just three basic recipes for the three types of chocolate, the dark chocolate, the milk chocolate, the white chocolate. And you can see what the additives are. It's really pretty simple recipes. Um, the details come in, what are the proportions? Those are top secret for our lab. We don't share them unless you ask. Um, of, of, what, of what we make them. Typically, the students and I, we really like low sugar chocolates. In the US, the FDA definition for a milk chocolate, 70% sugar. Our chocolates that we make with milk are around 20 or 30% sugar. We could not actually sell it as a milk chocolate. We would have to call it a chocolate with milk solids because the milk chocolate name requires that particular recipe be followed. And we don't like that one. Dark chocolate just has the solids. You add a little extra cocoa butter and some sugar. White chocolate, there's no cocoa solids in it. It's just cocoa butter, sugar, and uh, milk powder. You want no water in there because water will tend to uh, make an emulsion with the cocoa butter, the fat part of the beans, and it will form a very solid-like fluid. Um, even at well above its melting point, it's gonna hold its shape and that's gonna damage the equipment. So you really don't want that to happen. We don't have that problem in the lab because we have good quality control on all of our inputs. In industry, their equipment is worth millions and millions of dollars. They add something to prevent that from happening um, just to protect their investment in the equipment. That something they add is a uh, emulsifier, typically soy lecithin, but there are others. This is a molecule that's gonna form a bridge between the water and the fat or the cocoa butter. And so it's gonna remain a single phase instead of going into a, a multi-phase mixture. That's something we teach about in chemical engineering all the time. Multi-phases is, is it's not scary, but it has some strange properties. This one makes something called a non-Newtonian fluid. It does not behave the way you would want. It stays a liquid, it shears when you touch it, but it also will keep its shape 30 degrees above the, the normal melting temperature. So it's, it's weird and we don't want that. Um, cheap chocolatiers will add extra lecithin to their chocolate and then they're gonna cut it with some water. You can add 5% water if you add enough lecithin. If you've ever eaten a chocolate that made your mouth feel like it had a, a, a coating inside of it, it felt kind of slimy, that's the lecithin um, adhering to the roof of your mouth and the moisture there and then putting a coating of fat all over it. 
And that's one way you can really tell that you have a cheap chocolate with a lot of lecithin, it's probably been cut with water. We also will do add flavors and inclusions. Flavors we can add in the chocolate recipe during the melanging process. Um, the inclusions are things that you coat like raisins and cherries and nuts. Lyndon, do you wanna do the melanger? Yes, thank you very much. One of the processes to start our reduction in size uh, just before we reach the uh, chocolate chocolate bar product is the melanging process. This is done with a machine called a melanger. It is basically a granite stone that rolls inside of a unit and it crushes the nibs and the sugar particles to a size of about five microns. Now your hair diameter is about 200 microns, but your tongue can only taste up to about 50 microns a size. Anything over that tastes gritty or sandy in your chocolate. And below that is why you want to have uh, your particles of a small size around five to 25 microns because your chocolate will take on a taste profile that is very liquid and smooth and not at all gritty. Conchin happens about 24 to 48 hours into the melangin process, maybe a little longer. What happens is that the fat particles in your chocolate liqueur, they start forming conch shell shapes, uh, crystals in your chocolate, and, 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 and they come back uh, into an increased size. And this is a sort of a desirable aspect that chocolate makers and chocolatiers try to achieve when they're doing this specific process in the chocolate making. It, as it says, it drives off some of the volatile acids. And at that point, you would be losing flavors uh, to your chocolate, which will impact your final buy. It does not mean it will not taste chocolatey, but you will lose certain light notes like the cherry flavors or the uh, terra noir of the woody flavors or the earthy flavors. So here's a short video of what the melanging equipment looks like. You can see the stone wheels um, and then you can see the stone base inside and the melanger will rotate the stone base and the wheels will just glide over it. They're rotating. So any of the nibs that get caught between that base and the wheel get crushed. So it's really a crushing process. It still happens even in the liquid phase. The, part, the particulates of the cocoa solids are still being crushed the whole time they're in there. Um, the amount of time that you might melange varies. Uh, in the US, 24 hours is often considered adequate. Um, Swiss chocolate, their legal definition for a chocolate requires a 72 hour melange uh, or they can't call it Swiss chocolate. So this machine would be left on running for 72 hours. We're doing a little experiment in the lab. Here you can see the chocolate in the melanger being um, crushed. It's got some baffles in there. Make sure you get some really excellent mixing. It's a really awesome way to show students what mixing looks like. Um, most people are associate mixing with maybe a glass of hot chocolate and you just stir it with the spoon and you just think that that spoon is doing the mixing. That's actually really poor mixing. You're putting a lot of energy and not getting very good mixing. A device like this is more of the energy is going into the mixing and less into just uh, random motions that aren't causing shear between adjacent particles, which is a very nerdy chemical engineering way to talk about mixing. Um, if you want more details, let me know. I'll take one of my classes. <laughs> You'll learn all about what good mixing is. Once it's been melanged, we go to the tempering. Um, tempering is a heat treatment process. I know it might sound odd, but the cocoa butter actually has different crystal structures, just like salt or sugar are in crystals, um, and steel and iron have crystals, cocoa butter does too. You don't normally think of organic solids as having these crystal structures, but many of them actually do. You can control which crystal structure you get by doing a heat treatment. It's the exact same concept that they use for steel and iron. This one I'm comfortable letting students do at the desk, right in front of them. 
I would not be comfortable letting a student do the heat treatment of steel and do the tempering process from liquid molten metal to making a, a solid. I would be very uncomfortable with that. It would be very, very dangerous. Cocoa butter, the worst that's gonna happen is you get a little chocolate on your sleeve. It's not a big deal. Um, we want to control the crystal structure and we do that by controlling how it gets heated and cooled. So if you cool it very carefully, um, you can form just one particular crystal. You can see in the highlight there that type five is the one that we like. It gives you this shiny appearance. It's smooth texture. The crystals are very tiny. You get some strength in the chocolate so that it makes a crisp snap when you break it. If you have a different one of the tempering polymorphs, you're gonna, the chocolate might just crumble. You also won't necessarily get a consistent color that's smooth and shiny, but it might be blotchy or spotty or um, have variations of white to brown with some dark patches in some little round white spots that look remarkably like mold, but really aren't. They're just the cocoa butter splitting out of the solution and forming its own crystal, typically a type one or a type two for that. Lyndon. Here we have a finalizing process. And what you see here in our picture are some of our chocolates that have been produced at our lab here at UMD. At the top right corner, you may see some with rice grip seeds on there. And we like to also include other additives like flavor oils. We make inclusions like ganache and fruit, fresh cherries. Sometimes we do dried fruit that we produce right in the lab. We've made basil flavored chocolate, wasabi flavored chocolate, ghost peppered flavored chocolates, uh, just about anything we have been able to put Garlic on. chocolate, don't forget the garlic chocolate. Yes, we've, we've just, just about any and everything, uh, fresh or dried, we've dipped into the chocolate. And we also have a chocolate fountain in our lab where fresh fruit can be dressed in chocolate in real time. And uh, we've, that is extremely popular, but now not so much in our given days of our pandemics. Uh, molding, we do a lot of different size and shapes of molds. We've been experimenting with 3D printing uh, on our chocolates or using 3D, uh, a Glowforge laser printer to print uh, customized logos on chocolates. Um, we've been doing a different number of tempering studies. We've had the students make chocolates and put them into bags and see how long they can stay at room conditions without blooming. And decorating our chocolates, we go all out sometimes. We get little boogly eyes and nice little reindeer ears and we stick it all, all over the chocolates and air is just a great hit. We, we do a lot of social events to the point that we have started a student club run by the students and they do a once per semester chocolate sale and they do very well. All right, so here you can see our uh, wonderful collection of molds. Um, sometimes we use the money from our sales to buy molds. Sometimes students' families just, they have a mold or two around their house and they donate it to the lab. Um, we have just all kinds of crazy shapes. The students absolutely love those Star Wars ones. That's the Han Solo and Carbonite. We make a chocolate shape of that. That's a real favorite. Um, we have Lego Men. That's another favorite. There's uh, each student generally has their own favorite. I really like the unicorns, but there are flowers and stuff. This is a really magic material here. It's called diffraction grading. And we mold our chocolate on top of it and we make a rainbow chocolate. So you can see we shine a light on it and the light diffracts off the surface of the chocolate and makes a beautiful, beautiful color. The cocoa tea, I'm gonna let Lyndon talk about this one because he turned me on to it. It's awesome. Yes. Les Miserables. <laughs> what we're talking about is that uh, the Mr. Cadbury back in the 1800s, when he uh, first had his uh, chocolate factory in England, he gave the, sh the shells and the husk to the workers, the Irish, who he could care less, of, less for uh, as a waste product. And they, it, if you tried eating cocoa husk, it really is tough going. 
you can't really do it. It's very fibrous and sh uh, tough and uh, a, a sort of a woody texture, even though it's roasted down to crumbly. Uh, it's used as a soil amendment. You can buy cocoa husk at some of the hardwares to be put into your soils. Here, I've seen it around. Uh, we use it in potpourri type ornamental and uh, fragrance aromatherapy type items, but also it's been traditionally used as the source of a very, very invigorating tea. So what we have found is that uh, cocoa tea gives you uh, the same stimulant effect like a cup of coffee or a cup of tea would, except it's not caffeine. It's theobromine, which is a relative uh, molecule to caffeine, but it has very different effects. It's rather than making you feel energized, it sort of gives you a smile on your face and makes you feel a little bit more relaxed. And it, it is what it, it does. It's a theobromine molecule and uh, we, um, it translates uh, from the Latin theobromine to mean food of the gods. And that's what the Aztecs referred to it as. Uh, food from God. And here it is, we call cocoa shells the waste, but really uh, they are truly a valuable source of a, a byproduct. We have students who have been making tea bags and refilling uh, cotton tea bags that they, that they sell at their, their chocolate club sales. And these tea husks can also be used as flavorings for brewing items like uh, commercial beer or stouts. Uh, a lot of potential exists for this byproduct at this time. So here we're looking again at the nibs coming straight out of there. In a moment, we'll get to see the shells. Um, but you can just kind of see what they look like. If you could smell it, it would smell so wonderful at this stage. You really get the chocolate experience just from standing over a bowl of nibs. It's pretty amazing stuff. Here, Steve having his daily cup of cocoa tea. Limited edition chemical engineering mug there. We've been giving those to our graduates the last couple of years. If you're an alum of the department and you don't have one of those cups, let me know. I will make sure you get one. And I might have to put chocolate in it to keep it safe. <laughs> oh, I'm having my Star Wars cup that day. Yeah. <laughs> We've had a lot of visitors there. We've gone from preschoolers to the president of the university have all visited. There you have President Kaler, uh, Chancellor Black and uh, one of the Board of Regents, uh, um, um, they, they're in the background there. And uh, they really enjoyed this process. Their tour was supposed to be about 15 minutes. They spent over an hour there. We went through every single step with them. They got hands-on, they got dirty. Each Everybody there ended up with chocolate on their suit jacket. It was just a wonderful experience. Um, we did the tempering. I had them make unicorns because that's one of my favorite molds. Um, they just had a blast. But we've had university for seniors there. We've had preschoolers, middle schoolers, everything. Chocolate club. Uh, the students love this lab. I wish I would have thought of it a lot earlier um, and not my other ideas as to what would be a good process to help students learn. You can see here students just being completely engaged in doing the process of molding the chocolate here. And there's a, just a fantastic picture of pure joy from chocolate there. I just love that picture of Grace. It's just awesome. Uh, one of the things that is really nice about the lab is students get so comfortable in there. They are willing to ask all those hard questions like, why do we do it this way? Why don't we do it a different way? How come we do this? So they ask all those questions that are just wonderful engineering questions. And my answer always is, well, let's design an experiment around that and see if we can figure out if there is a better way or how might we decide whether it should be 36 hours or 72 hours or 96 hours for the melange. Why don't we do that experiment and do a taste test and figure out. I, the lab allows students to be very, very creative. This is a picture of the drying beds in Trinidad 
Yep. And here you can see, this is a, a little video shot in the lab of some of the student posters um, that students have done. Get everything from a really detailed project like that, to students just rebuilding a piece of equipment, to artwork. So in the lower corner there, you can see right here, student drew some cocoa pods, painted it, and put the theobromine molecule embedded into the acrylic there. I've had students try to rebuild a winnower. You can see that beautiful picture of them. That design totally failed. It was, it was a great thing. They thought more distance there would be great. It really did not work. Here's a drawing that's paper and the medium is chocolate. So that is drawn in chocolate. So just another example of students getting creative um, just because of their excitement and enthusiasm for chocolate. Lyndon, let's go down to Trinidad and talk about yes. cocoa trees. So cocoa trees, they grow down in the tropics and in Trinidad where I'm from and why this became such a big deal is that Trinidad is the world's epicenter for all of the chocolate uh, on earth. That's because there's a genetic gene bank, a gene bank, uh, you might think of a box of seeds in a cold freezer somewhere, but in Trinidad, cocoa trees, their pods and their seeds are only viable for just a couple of weeks. So they literally have to keep about 35 of every species of cocoa tree alive today on this plantation on the island of Trinidad. And uh, yeah, it's a pretty big deal to have all 2,000 odd species kept alive and well at this plantation. So yeah, Trinidad, uh, a pod, it's, it's like there you see on the, on, it grows right off the, the trunk of the tree, it's harvested, it's similar to a squash, very hard shell. And when you cut it open with your machete, you might find between 25 to about a hundred seeds in there all coated with a very jelly-like substance that's sweet and fruity smelling and pretty awesome to, to just snack on. It's delicious. What we have here is a photo of a cocoa pod being open, fresh off the, the tree. And in there, you can see the white seeds coated with that delicious stuff. It tastes, tastes like a Jolly Rancher type candy and the very hard husk around it and an airspace in there. And on the right side, you can see an old photo of about 10 different varieties of cocoa pods. And these pods would have been identified maybe about a hundred years ago uh, at the university in Trinidad, which was at the time a British university called the Imperial College of Tropical Agriculture, where most of uh, the European research on chocolate took place. And that's why we do have left over those chocolate uh, legacy of research. And one of these, these posters and the labs and the fields that have been left over have been acquired by the present day University of the West Indies. And we have been revitalizing the chocolate industry on the island of Trinidad for say the last 20 years since it really took off in the world. And climate change has taken a toll for the worse. We have trees dying out in their natural habitat and people having to go move cocoa trees to grow in other places of the world where they're not from. And this of course creates all different types of new issues. Here we have Professor Sternberg and our class, our study abroad class, which we will be leaving uh, the second class, we are hired to leave here in about three weeks with 15 students. And we will be visiting this very farm where Professor Steinberg and his students here are collecting cocoa beans that were judged number two for flavor in the world for dark chocolate. And these are in Trinidad, this plantation, we get about a hundred pounds of beans and the students bring these back to Duluth uh, when we're done harvesting them and fermenting them and drying them. That's a lot of beans. And we go through those beans by hand. Everyone here, you have a picture of all our students sorting through the beans. And if we were to tell you how many of tiny fruit flies are around there, it would be amazing. But fruit flies now are just a part of the process. They bring the yeasts 
to the beans and that starts the fermentation process, which is very essential to our next step here, where you have to let the fermentation proceed naturally and it has to go to the full length where the yeast consume all of that sweet stuff that's outside of the fresh bean. And in that, the ethanol that's produced cooks the bean, it pickles it a little bit. And on the right side, the bean changes from a white color from being just brand new into the ferment box to a very purple and pink color with ridges forming in there that you can see uh, that are characteristic of the beans closer to the penknife. And those are well done down there. And at that point, your master fermenter would say, this batch of beans are done. It's time to put them on to the drying racks to seize the fermentation process. And at this point here, you can see on the left, the gentleman, his name is Mr. Martin Matthew. He is the farmer who has won second place in the world a number of times for these beans. They are prize winning and they're very highly awarded. And he has been our host for our study abroad. And on the right side, you would see Professor Sternberg and myself. And we are examining some beans in the month of J July, where it is very rare to have any beans because cocoa beans, they are harvested once a year. Cocoa trees, they don't usually have a whole bunch of pods all of the time on them. It takes a long time, almost three to four months for one pod to be born from a flowering to the time it's harvested. And it's a lot of it is dependent on the amount of rain. And some years you don't have as much beans as you see here. Sometimes it's very little bit because there's a lot of rain or diseases. This is a good year for Mr. Martin. One thing I always like to help students learn about our, our ethics. It's often an awkward conversation in a class because it feels forced and not just a natural part of say a food mechanics class or a, a mass balance class. But with the chocolate lab, the ethics is a really central part of the entire process. So we try to use direct trade or fair trade beans. I've already discussed that a little bit, um, but there are some people who estimate around 90% of cocoa beans produced worldwide are using slave labor or child labor. Um, the fair trade label, part of that is it requires that slaves and children are not used in their production. Um, it's good as far as it goes, but it has to be enforced. Countries that don't have good enforcement for fair trade, um, don't have 100% bean production that are slave free. Another thing that fair trade tries to encourage is gender equity, but it has to also respect the local culture, right? You can't have gender equity the way it is in the US if women are not allowed to own uh, the land or the estate. So it would mean something different in that culture, but you still try to make sure that everyone gets treated as well as possible understanding the limitations of a local culture. One of the nice things about direct trade is it's a direct agreement between the producer and the importer. The farmer gets a higher price. I think on the next slide, we show a little um, thing about this. So this is one of the beans that we've had in the past. And this little cut sheet here comes from the um, importer to talk about the beans, where they grow, who's growing it, what kind of money they're getting, what type of environment they have, what are the characteristics of what they do. Um, and this is when you can see that the farmer's getting more than twice the traditional market price for their beans by going through this importer rather than just selling it at the market. And so that's, you know, that's a lot more money in their pocket. And you get that by um, not increasing the price necessarily to the final consumer, but by cutting out the middleman. And the direct importer is going to go there to make sure that they have the characteristics they want to sell by, which is the direct trade, no slaves, um, people treated well in the process. Doing a study abroad, December 27, January 10. It's going to be awesome. Trinidad is just an amazing Caribbean island. Um, it's my next slide to show the position of it. There it is. Southernmost of the Caribbean islands, right near Venezuela. It's just an absolutely beautiful place, wonderful people. Um, you get to walk around in the jungle, but it's not the jungle like you need a machete to take each step. It looks a lot like the woods, only the trees are really different. And if you get hungry, you just walk three feet and you find a fruit tree and you eat. 
It's um, absolutely amazing place. Why do we go to Trinidad? Well, as Lyndon said, the University of West Indies has their cocoa research center there. It's also the place that has the highest genetic diversity of cocoa trees. And they have that wonderful seed bank, which I think is our next picture. There's me and my wife, Lyndon, and an undergraduate student and a graduate student. We went down to do a scout out before we did our study abroad. And one of the places we scouted was the gene bank there. And you can just see tree after tree after tree. The cocoa trees are understory trees. So you need to have other trees growing around them. Lyndon and I have some really interesting thoughts about, well, if you choose particular overstory trees, can you impact the flavor of the beans? And we're hoping to explore that a little bit on our next trip down. Correct. Yes, Trinidad. There's the real reason to go to Trinidad. It's beautiful there. I will just put in here that uh, when we are down there in the next three weeks, we're expected, Professor Sternberg is expected to become a recipient of a plot, a research plot that we hope that he will accept uh, where he goes to get uh, to work with a chocolatier down there in Trinidad that will become a sort of a base for his future opportunities for alumni and uh, study abroad students to go down and plant trees and create a lasting impact uh, so that they could have their very own UMD cocoa research plot in the Caribbean on the island that we can have for our college. So with that, I'll let you have this beautiful scenery and those awesome thoughts. Thank you for this time today, everyone. Well, thank you both for um, guiding us along on that wonderful tour. Um, we are now going to transition to our live question and answer. Um, so we will flip our cameras on here and get started. There we go, perfect. So we had quite a few questions come in um, live here and also some that were submitted ahead of time through the registration. So we will try to get through as many of them as we can. Um, so I think the first one that we'll start off with is um, about the cocoa beans and wondering what the shelf life of them are, roasted versus non-roasted. The cocoa seed is viable for about three weeks after which point you can't grow from it again. The cocoa beans themselves have at least a five year shelf life and it's probably longer. Um, we have bought beans that were three or four years old and if anything, the flavor is just a slightly more mild. There are no off flavors from it. Um, some of the more acidic compounds may have evaporated away, but it still makes just wonderful chocolates. I, I'm thinking about the Vietnamese Ben Trey estate beans. Those we had from 2018 and we, we made some this year and it was really wonderful flavor of chocolate. It just hits you over the head with the chocolate. Wonderful. Um, our next question uh, is just a follow-up question um, about your chocolate sale and wondering um, how do people hear about this and um, would you, is there an opportunity for people to purchase chocolate and it be mailed to them? You know, we have talked about that. Our last chocolate sale was just word of mouth. We opened up the lab door and pushed the table to the front and we just sold right out of the lab. Um, and we sold out every single day. And we kind of had to scramble like, oh my God, we need to make more chocolate. Ah. And so we had no trouble with that. We sold everything we could make. Um, we started making lots and lots of cocoa tea. We sold out all of our cocoa tea from our shelves. It was just amazing. Um, we are thinking about how we might do a uh, sale to alums, um, kind of an order form to begin with, and then we could start making the chocolate maybe a bit earlier to make sure we have enough. Um, that's going to require somebody to organize. Sometimes students are good at that. Uh, Dr. Steve is not good at that. Just keeping students going in there and making sure the dishes get washed is not, it's, my, it's hands full for me. Um, so I guess that's actually a great lead into the next question. Do you need volunteers? Um, this person asked for taste testers, but I know you'd mentioned washing um, some of the, the dishes and equipment and whatnot, but are volunteers ever needed? Yes. Um, uh, we try to keep the lab open Monday through Friday, eight to five. We don't always have staffing for all those hours. It's mostly student volunteers, kind of the ones that have gone through the safety training. We have seven of them. 
and they typically take on two hour shifts each week. And then I'm there about six hours a week. I hold my office hours in the chocolate lab and it's open. Anyone who wants to come in, if you want to learn more, we'll help you learn more. If you're a student, we'll let you actually train up through the safety training process, become a monitor, and then you can have the lab open more often. Um, but we do have people just come in and typically they will help pour the chocolate. They'll wash the dishes, of course, sweep the floor, all those things that have to happen. Um, but we love to have visitors. Wonderful. Um, this question is asking about how is the chocolate lab supported? Mostly through the department itself. So the department gives us a small amount of money. I originally had a grant to buy all the equipment. It was about $5,000. We got the melangers, we got the juicer, we got the, all the equipment we needed. Um, and then through the sales that the lab has, we buy more products like cocoa beans and cocoa butter and sugar. And um, there's a pretty strong need for Rice Krispies. And I donate caramels that I make myself. Uh, we have we just we do what we can. If anybody wants to send us money, you will know it will be well spent on making chocolate. And certainly we would share samples with you for any kind of a donation to send it to the department or the college and earmark it through the chocolate lab and it'll happen. Perfect. Um, this question is wondering if any of your former students have gone on to be chocolatiers. We have one at Cargill right now who does the chocolate stuff there. Um, Cargill typically does not hire US people in their chocolate division. They want the Europeans who are well known for awesomeness in making chocolate. But with the experience of this chocolate lab, the student was able to get their way in there. Maybe we'll get more in the future. And then do they ever come back um, to the chocolate lab and interact with current students? That was a year ago, so not yet. Not yet, okay. I'm hoping, we. the chocolate lab's only been around about three and a half years. And it started off in this picture here shows us in the little closet we were once in. It's now expanded to a larger lab and we can get uh, 20 people tours in there now. Whereas this room, getting five people in there was really crowded. Sure. Um, this other question is wondering, where is the cocoa tea sold? And is that something that you can buy in supermarkets or is this something that you need to really make on your own? Lyndon, you want to answer that one? Thank you for that question. The cocoa tea is not available in supermarkets. The easiest way to make it on your own would be to get your hands on some cocoa beans, which you can procure from the internet or Professor Stenberg's lab, or if you went in, uh, maybe even your local co-op would get you some cocoa beans. And if you were able to get cocoa nibs too, you could also use those as a substitute to the husk, but the husk is so thin and uh, brittle that it yields the flavor much more quickly and a less fatty content to your tea. Not to say that cocoa nibs aren't great for tea also, but if you just had a, uh, a pound of cocoa nib beans ordered from a website. A lot of websites were listed on our site, on our presentation today. You can get a small batch and some of these sites also sell the husks that you can purchase directly. Uh, they, they also have recognized the value of the husk as a value added product and you can purchase it there, but it's not something you would find anywhere at Costco or your big chain stores. Makes sense. I, I did find cocoa tea for sale once at a farmer's market in San Francisco, just once. <laughs> just once. Um, awesome. Well, we have another question that just was in live wondering about the climate ranges and extremes um, that cocoa beans will grow in. That's you, Lyndon. It is me. Yes, I do have a bachelor's degree in agronomy and I grew up pretty much in a cocoa field, spent all of my childhood summers there and proposed to my wife in a cocoa field also. <laughs> so it is pretty warm place. Uh, cocoa beans like it around 80 degrees. Uh, think tropical Amazon, steamy rainforest, low level canopy, way under the canopies in the dark areas of uh, the rainforest is shaded, it's muggy, it's always moist. But it's cool down there too, in a way. Uh, but it, cocoa trees like it warm. If it ever gets too hot, 
the trees can get bleached and die. Uh, it happens when they lose their protective canopy cover, which is a second crop of trees that you must plant long-term. And well before you plant your cocoa trees, you have to take advanced planting to put your trees in a place that they will be shaded. Uh, yeah, so there is a lot of uh, climatic parameters that keep cocoa restricted to certain regions in the Amazon basin. So, so then could there ever be a cold hardy strain ever developed? I, uh, that I don't think would ever happen. You would have to put snow into the Amazon to try to uh, see that happen. <laughs> it would be bad. I, I don't think so. Sure. We did have a group of people that were interested in growing cocoa in Minnesota, but it was yep. good indoor hydroponics yep. kind of activity. Yep. So I don't think that ever had took off, um, but it was a really fun idea to think about. Mm -hmm. For sure. Well, I think um, we have time for one more question and kind of a fun one. So of all the chocolates that you've made over the course of the last three years, each one of you, can you share which one has been your favorite? Oh, hands down, the ones that we got from Martin and Jackie in Trinidad. They yeah. Just an amazing flavor. There's chocolate, but it's it is the fruitiest chocolate. I mean, you don't even have to put fruit in it. It just smacks you over the head that this is a <laughs> chocolate. It's so yeah. It's this is true. This is true. Trinidad has the the best diversity of chocolates. And just before leaving on our last trip, my older brother is also a chocolatier and who's the donor of the field here that we're talking about, the research field that we're hoping to get some of you donors uh, alumni in. We're designing chocolate beans, and I'm going to tell you this again. We're designing chocolate beans. We're co-interplanting the trees with bananas and pomegranates. So this is our plan to have chocolates that have their very own designer flavor. And it is true. Yes, there are plantain and banana flavored beans that when you produce these chocolates like we do in our lab, the entire place smells of a fruit and nothing like chocolate. It's just amazing sensation. Oh, wonderful. Well, it sure has been a pleasure having the two of you um, share your insight and experience um, on this slide here. If you have other questions that weren't answered today, um, there's some contact information. As a reminder, we will be sending out a follow-up email with a survey. And once our link to the video recording is done, you'll also receive that as well. Um, our office usually uh, averages about one to two of these sessions a month. So um, if you are not an alum and would like to be on our mailing list, feel free to send us an email and we'll get you on there. Um, again, a big thanks to the two of you. This was wonderful um, and we hope to see you all again. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Take care.